thank you all for coming. Um, you're going to hear some really interesting talks today. Um, we've had some small changes to the programme. Unfortunately, Rebecca Sivoir can't make it, but we've got Sam Pitts, who's stepped in to um, um, give a talk about proton um, therapy. Um, and there's been a small change. Um, Sean Higgins is going to be speaking this morning in Rebecca Sevoir's um, position. Um, but other than that, it should be a very interesting day. And, and well, in, even with that, it's going to be a very interesting day. I would like to make you aware of a new uh, online forum that we've set up for this network. The IET have very kindly offered to host a forum. It's where we're going to have all our discussions of the future of this um, network and where we will post all the talks, the videos and the slides from the previous three years of meetings as well. So, um, yeah, we're going to have a poster session at lunchtime in the Diamond Atrium. Um, please have a look at the student posters. We'll be presenting the uh, prize. It's the IET student poster prize. We'll be presenting that just after lunch. Um, but now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dave McGuinness, who is going to talk to us about the ESS Accelerator. So, over to Dave. Uh, it was this one, engineering. Am I muted or? Okay. Okay. Um, also, uh, if you give me a heads up when I'm halfway through instead of five minutes, okay. that would be awesome. great. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I didn't expect to see such a big crowd. Uh, I would have gotten dressed up. Uh, anyway, um, I've been working at ESS for five years. I'm an old timer at ESS. That uh, makes me one of the, the original guys. Um, I originally, I used to work at uh, Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. Um, I was the booster department head, then the antiproton source department head, and then I ran Tevatron operations for a while. And then I decided to come over to work on the European Spallation Source uh, for a big challenge once the Tevatron kind of closed down. So I'll talk to you about mostly about the engineering challenges. There will be a lot of um, uh, some of the usual dry stuff about how it's bigger and better and better than anything, but we'll hopefully go through it. Um, I'd like to be kind of provoking in some of these things so that kind of make people think that it's not just all easy to do that. Um, I'll just go through this kind of briefly. ESS is a, is a, a neutron so spallation source, um, and it's going to be built by 17 European countries. Let me see if I know how to work this thing here. This shows you how good of engineering I am. Okay. All right. Um, it's, going to be uh, it's going to be located in southern Sweden, down here. This is where I live. Um, and it's going to be right next to Max 4. So the two of these guys will be put together. Um, the amazing thing is I come from, I was born in the city of Chicago, 10 million people, uh, and um, I'm used to lots of big things. And I'm amazed every time I think about this, a country of 10 million people is actually going to put in the largest uh, spallation source and one of the brightest uh, um, uh, synchrotron light sources in the planet for a very small area. So it really, I think, is a huge challenge just even to get the people there and even for even get the people to think how big of a deal that they're building here. People who built accelerators like you guys know how hard it's going to be. Okay, um, I know you guys here are experts at, uh, at uh, neutron spallation, but I'll just go over it anyway. Um, the neutron spallation source, uh, it, it's a, a measure for new and neutron scattering measurements. I'm not a neutron scientist. I have no idea how it works. I just listen to people. But basically gives you a complementary view of matter, okay? So that uh, uh, that is my test stand in Lund is leak leaking right now, so they're calling me. Um, so... Uh, the, um, um, it, if, for, for, if you take a look at x-rays, which are light sources, uh, they look at heavy metals very well. That's why they look at the calcium in your bones. But basically, they're trans, the, the, the lower things like hydrogen and, and carbon are, are transparent, and the neutrons give you an alternative view of that. And uh, the best way this strikes home for me is to basically take a look at this picture. This is the only way I really understand why it's so, so important. Here's an X-ray image of an SLR camera. You see all the metal parts. Here's a neutron radiograph, and you see all the plastic parts. So that one, one is not better than the other. 
they're just complementary to each other, and I think that's actually why it's really great and that, that you have here is you have basically a place like ISIS and you have the light source. When you usually have the two of them together, you have a great facility for things to do. So, so Lunda's doing the same thing. And then you can also just do lots of different things that I don't quite understand, but basically it gets an alternative view of measuring lattices and also doing uh, radio, uh, uh, neutron radiographs. Okay, um, traditional neutron sources, uh, they're, ba they're reactor based. Um, and the neutron flux, flux is limited by reactor cooling. So typically they're about 25 megawatts. IL, ILL um, in France, Grenoble, France is the workhorse right now uh, for that. Um, the energy spectrum uh, is measured by using time of flight, using neutron choppers, and then the chopping throws away a lot of the neutron flux so that you get that. So the, the, the brightness is limited. Um, spallation sources consist of a pulse accelerator that shoots protons into a target and kind of peels those neutrons off, and then those neutrons are then guided in by guides into the experiments. Um, the pulse nature of an accelerator makes the neutron gives the neutron brightness, whereas the average flux for a, uh, a new reactor can be very high. It's not very bright. So looking for rare processes is a much better way of doing it with a spallation source than it is with traditionally a reactor. So if you really want to look at rare processes, then a, a, pulse, a pulse accelerator is the way to go. Okay, so typically a, new, a spallation neutron source, I don't know much about ISIS and I apologize for not putting it up there, but I do know about SNS. You basically have an accelerator. There's usually a compression ring in the accelerator and then you have a target and then you have your instruments coming off the target. So that's the standard thing that you have uh, with this. And I think ISIS is similar to this. Okay, so what's so different about ESS? Um, ESS is it, the biggest thing, it's the headline number, it's five megawatts. SNS is one megawatts. I think ISIS is around 200 kilowatts. Okay, so five megawatts will, will be, is, is basically, that's one of the biggest things about it, um, which is five times greater than the SNS, uh, than the NSS beam power. That means that the total proton energy per pulse will be 360 kilojoules, okay? And you can think of this, a military hand grenade is about 400 kilojoules. So each pulse is basically a military hand grenade. Okay, so it's, it's, quite, it's, it's quite, quite intense. Um, the beam brightness is proportional to the number of neutrons per pulse, and the 360 kilojoules is over 20 times greater than the SNS total production energy per pulse. Okay, so this is a big deal. This is really hard to do. Uh, it's one of the, the hardest parts of, of ESS is actually the, the brightness. So short pulses, uh, neutron sources, um, are, let's see, does this work here? Because I can, my neck is gonna get craned down. Yeah, cool, okay, good. Uh, I'll get a sore neck if I keep doing this. Okay, um, t t typically, for short, no, the neutrons are cooled by a moderator downstream of the target, and the time constant of the moderator is 100, about 100 milliseconds. Okay, so basically, it kind of I look at it as kind of like a, a cold balloon. You just basically put your, your you you pull your neutrons off the target, and they come into this cold balloon, and they get they get thermalized uh, by by bouncing around in the moderator. So, what you need to do with short pulses, you have a linac, and the peak power of a linac is limited by how much energy a klystron can or the klystron can pour into the beam. So the peak beam current is rather low in linacs. So if you really want to have a lot of uh, beam current, use a compressor ring. And a compressor ring are typically around in the order of 300 meters in circumference, which usually means about a microsecond in pulse length. All right. So that means you take all your energy and you put it into a micro, uh, around uh, a microsecond of pulse length. Um, and at that point there, you, you have one. You uh, you have uh, a microsecond of pulse length, and basically what comes out is 100 milliseconds of neutron flux. So you have this pulse come in here, and then it slowly dribbles out. So this, what, what this does is stresses the heck out of the target. Okay, you really shock the target very hard, and that's the limitation to SNS, is basically the, how hard you can hit the target. If you try to go into any higher beam power, like make the Linux stronger, then basically the target can't handle it. So what SNS's upgrade path is to have two targets. Okay, and two targets is not really, a lo is kind of a logarithmically pretty slow way of doing things. So the, but the idea would be is try to get the pulse length to be as long as the time, the moderation time constant. Um, there's a proposal done by me a long time ago when I first heard about this. Well, I said, well, if you do that, then you can maybe do some of these fast kickers that you can come up with that the people in, in um, the ILC were talking about from the compressor rings. Uh, is basically take fast kickers out. 
um, because originally the neutron folks were thinking about having very large rings, and they said, no, you could probably do fast kickers. So people could look at this paper here, and this might be the future, I think, of neutron sources, um, but it's hard to do, is to take a, a compressor ring, which is, which is very nice to have, but basically pull the pulses out one at a time over a long period of time so you don't stress the target. So that's a, that's a challenge for pe people in the future. Okay, so what ESS does, it uses the long pulse concept. So we do get rid of the compressor ring, and it has some really nice features, it has some bad features to it. So then you take the 360 kilojoule and you spread it over three milliseconds, okay? Um, then at over three milliseconds, that way the, the, the amount of energy deposition on the target is spread over a much longer period of time, so you're not shocking the target. Um, the trade-offs for that thing is that then you have to have design your experiment, and I'm not very good at understanding what you do, but basically you have longer beam lines, you have more complexity in how you design your experiment. You still have the issue with the long pulse that you need to chop at that point to do time of flight measurements. So that will limit your beam brightness because you have to do some chopping on there. So basically it's a big uh, uh, struggle between having really beam brightness and not blowing your target up. Um, so the most difficult thing about ESS, it's not the accelerator, it's the target. The target is going to be made of, out of uh, um, tungsten. It's going to be a large wheel that rotates. There's some issues whether or not we're going to actually put it in a helium atmosphere or we're going to put it in its, in its own vacuum because the problem is, is that now once you have the target, the next part is the beam window between your accelerator and the target. And ESS is in the regime now where the beam windows, will, will, or we're really worried about how to make the beam windows. Okay, the big thing is ESS is a construction. That's, that's unbelievable. And in Europe, when you dig a hole, you usually finish a project. Unlike the United States, when you dig a hole, you sometimes forget what you're doing and you fill it back in like the SSC. Okay, so, um, so we're actually, we're, we, we have, it's really funny to work with the Swedes sometimes because we have very shiny floors. We says we don't want shiny floors in the tunnel, but you're getting them. So we have very shiny floors in the tunnel. So um, anyway, so it, it's really an amazing thing. It's incredible how fast the civil construction is going. Um, ESS is supposed to cost only a mere 1.86 billion euros. The accelerator is 500 million euros. That's a challenge for us. If anybody takes a look at an accelerator this complexity, when we first did the cost estimate, it was about 700 million euros. And then we did some things to, to chop it down, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So it's going to be a real challenge to make this for 500 million euros uh, to do that. Um, this is basically profits are up, sales are up, all that kind of stuff. That We'll see whether or not that actually happens. Okay. This is another huge challenge to ESS that I think will be really, really hard, um, is that ESS funding model is in kind. And so basically, Sweden, Denmark, and Norway, which is the big S, little d, little n, so hopefully no Danish here or, or Norwegians will tell this, but uh, basically the Swedes are doing most of the muscle in, di in digging that hole. Okay, so they're putting about 33% of the cost in. And the rest of Europe kicks in the rest with in-kind and cash contributions and they mostly want to do in-kind. And in-kind means you bring over your cryo module, you bring over your uh, pieces of equipment to put it in there. Typically, on most projects that I worked with, is in-kind is a very nice thing to do, but you're typically working on the order of 5 to 10% in-kind. You know, the LHC was not hugely in-kind. They might have said, but LHC is an international organization. LHC is a, uh, uh, a big international organization. But typically, you do most of your work in-house, and you farm out a little bit with in-kind, because the biggest problem with in-kind, it's the interfaces. Okay, so, and I'll talk a little bit what goes in there with that. So, so this is a real challenge. <clears throat> the next thing is the schedule. The schedule, we didn't groundbreak till 2014, and we say we're going to have beam by 2019. That's amazingly fast, okay? That, that's just a blink of your eye. And it's kind of funny when you, when you walk around Sweden and you sit there and say, what are you working on and why are you here? And I say, I'm working on ESS. And when's it going to be done? 2019, go, what's taking so long? So, so most people think of these projects in, in Sweden, they think that this is way too long of a time scale. Anybody that's built an accelerator says, whoa, this is lightning fast to, uh, to build something this quick. Okay, so... Um, I'm an accelerator guy. I'm mostly RF accelerator guy, uh, so my expertise is limited to certain things. Um, the ESS Linac is a picture here. This is a picture I did a long time ago, and I still like this picture because it was Google SketchUp, and I can do this. And when I was the RF group leader, I said, what is this going to look like? 
and I said, I know a klystron's about this big. We're going to have over 100 klystrons sitting in this linac, okay? And basically, we have this linac that's 500 meters long. And if you take a look at that, it's supposed to cost on the order of 500 million euros. That means that every time you take a foot, or this is 1 million euros, 2 million euros, 3 million euros, so on. Um, and people don't quite understand that, especially when it comes according to civil engineering. Civil engineers want to compress you, make you smaller. And you take a look at the civil engineering cost, it's about a factor of 20 less than the accelerator equipment cost. And this is one of the struggles we had to fight all the time, is trying to make sure that we can preserve enough space in there because don't skimp on space. It's really the equipment that costs a lot of money after, when you get done. Okay, so the overview, overview of the ESS Linac. Um, it's, the most power, it's gonna be the most powerful uh, proton Linac ever built. Five megawatts, peak beam power is 125 megawatts. It's a 4% duty factor machine. Okay, the acceleration's to 2 GeV. Uh, we're gonna put 62.5 milliamps. That's a tweaked number by somebody standing right here that tweaked it. The pulse length is 2.86 milliseconds, and the rep rate is 14 hertz. The reason for the 2.86 and the 14, that's to design the neutron flux. So what the experimenters wanna see is they wanna see a constant beam of neutrons coming, but they wanna be able to chop it. And so they have to pick the rep rate and the pulse length so that basically by the time their experiment's out there, they see this nice flow of neutrons coming past them, but they can get energy and uh, timing resolution from that as well. Um, so we're gonna require over 150 individual RF sources. Uh, they're gonna be based on high power electron tubes, 80, um, uh, Let's see, over 80% require over 1.1 megawatts of peak RF power and a duty a factor of 4%. We plan to spend at least 200 million euros on the RF system alone on this thing, okay? And also the RF system, uh, I'll throw some numbers in here. If you take a look at this, RF system is the equivalent of 2,500 AM radio stations. An AM radio station is 50 kilowatts. We're gonna have about basically 2,500 uh, uh, AM radio stations going there. Okay, so here's a, just a schematic layout of the Linac of what it looks like. All right, um, I like to put this slide up. It's a little childish, but I like to put this slide up just to remind me what five megawatts of beam power is. So one pulse happens 14 times per second, all right? And that each beam pulse has the same energy as a 16-pound shot traveling at uh, about 1,100 kilometers per hour, not Mach 0.93. So this is an amazing thing to think about. You got this superconducting machine and you got something 16 pounds coming at you at about Mach 1, 14 times a second. Um, it also has each beam pulse is the same as a 1,000 kilogram car traveling at 96 kilometers an hour. And then at five megawatts, this is important for this, this country, you can make a ton of tea in 83 seconds. <laughs> okay. Um, again, I know you guys are accelerator guys, but you know one of the things I'm, I'm used to trying to do is convince people what's different about this compared to the LHC. Everybody knows about the LHC, and the way I look at this as an LHC is a lot like a uh, um, is not like a power washer. Basically, you can fill your you have your garden hose behind here. It doesn't take a lot of water, but you have a pump, and this pushes this pump this up to a very high speed. So basically, you have uh, uh, not much water coming out, but then you pump it up, and you get to very high speed. ESS is more like a fire hydrant. The water doesn't come out very fast, but a whole lot of water comes out. Okay, so this is the kind of the thing to keep in mind on these things. And I think it's important for accelerator designers to keep this in head when they build these things. Okay, so this is the ESS Linac evolution. It's a never changing path. Uh, when it first came out back in the 90s, um, Britain uh, was, or the UK was, was dominant. Uh, in this, and they probably thought it was going to come here or somewhere around here. And basically, it was a normal conducting machine. Um, it had basically this funnel concept, looks really hard for me. You basically had four ion sources, and then you basically kept this. You had this reason why that was to keep the, uh, this was about 150 milliamps of beam current. And what you did is you divided it up into four places just to keep space charge under control. Okay? And then, then you basically went to here and moved that. Then you had to get your buddies, the French, involved. And once they showed up, they said, we have to get superconducting RF. So this is one of the biggest problems with in-kind contributions. You don't get to pick your accelerator technology based on what's the best thing to do. You have to do it because of politics. In my mind, this was the way to do it, okay? You know, normal conducting, it's a 4% duty cycle machine. 
You don't need to go cold to do it. But nobody wants to build a warm machine anymore. Everybody wants to build a superconducting machine. Then they had three. Then they added three funnels in there. Then they said, no, 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 that's crazy. Let's move back down to one. Uh, uh, move back to one funnel. Then went back to two funnels, and it kept going back. Then let's use ILC technology. ILC technology doesn't quite work. Finally, um, three or four of us showed up, and we basically had to come up with the next design. The next design, basically, what we did is the baseline design is basically a low, a low. Uh, value of beam current on the order of 50 to 60 milliamps. You have a normal conducting front end and you have a superconducting high end here starting from 90 MeV going to about the 2 Jev. SNS, this crossover here is at 200 MeV and the end is at 1 GeV. So this is a lot more of a cold machine than the SNS. The SNS has a 6% duty cycle. ESS has a 4% duty cycle. Sounds like 2%, no big deal. No, it's 50% more. Okay, so there's a whole heck of a lot difference in this. So the ESS dynamic to static load, if you take a look at this, is less than one. Okay, so we're building a lot of cold stuff um, and hardly ever using it. But again, we're building it, and I can't complain anymore, but it would, uh, the, the, the politics of in-kind makes you go to different places. Okay, so when we got this, when we first came in there, they said um, they had the normal conducting LINAC, and they said it costs, and they did a cost estimate back in early 2003, and they said it costs 1.86 billion euros. And then they, or whatever, and they adjusted it for inflation. In 2008, they said it's 1.86 billion euros. And then they changed their mind and said, oh, we want to have a superconducting Linux in there, but we want it to cost the same amount. But superconducting Linux don't, they cost substantially more uh, than normal conducting Linux. So what we had to do is we had to come up, we had to come up with a redesign. So we basically had originally 45 cryo modules, and we had to get down, we had to reduce that number of cryo modules down uh, substantially, because the cryo module is the thing that dominates the, po dominates the cost. Um, and I'm not going to go through all that. So what we did is originally we were at 2 GV, 2.5 GV, we dropped it down to 2 GV. Um, we took the gradient and we increased it by 10%. And then, we, and then basically we were able to get 33% fewer cryo modules because we increased the gradient and we increased the, uh, we, uh, increased the beam current. I won't go into all the details here. I can talk to people later about this thing. So now we have a new set of uh, headline parameters. We have a 2G VLNAC. We have 30 elliptical cryo modules. We increased the beam current and we have a 4% duty factor. So how do we do this? We increased our beam current by 25%. We increased our peak surface field by 12%. We changed how we did our high betas. We adopted a maximum voltage profile, which has some drawbacks, and we adopted a uniform lattice length to give us design flexibility and schedule flexibility. Okay, so when you do that, we change the number of cryo modules from 45 down to 30. Uh, each cryo module costs 6.5 million euros. Um, you don't get back the whole cost of doing that because you took your cryo module and you, you made less of them but you pushed them harder. So basically though, you can actually re get, you only lose, uh, you get to recover 80% of the cost of the cryo module. Not 100%, but 80%, it kind of works. And that's another thing, zero power costs money. So it's always better to have fewer, bigger things than it is to have many little things to do that because the overhead of having many little things costs a lot of money. Okay, thanks a lot, I better, I better pick it up then. <laughs> okay, um, the, the, then, okay, so, what happens now is you said, said, well, you didn't change things by that much. Well, what we did, we were already against the limit. We were pretty high already. So we had, we basically, if you take a look at it, our maximum coupler power is 12, is 1.2 kilowatts. We were at 850 kilowatts per coupler, and now we push it up to 1,100. So our design margin dropped by 70% on that. Our peak surface field, if you, there's, it's not a hard number, but people thought it was around 50 megavolts per meter. That's the surface field. We went from 40 megavolts per meter to 45 megavolt per meter. That means we reduced our design margin by 50%. So we took some pretty drastic risks to do this. Okay, but we use the long pulse complex, uh, a concept. If we can't, if we fail these, these things here, what happens? Either the energy goes down or the beam power goes down. Okay, so you, what you can do is you can recover that by leaving space in your tunnel, which doesn't cost that much more money, and you buy that back later on. So you basically, you, you, you made more risk. So you have to convince yourselves that you have to recover that risk. Sometimes you can do that by spending more money. Um, other ways that we did it is we made the tunnel 
a lot longer, about 150 meters longer than it needs to. It's got 150 meters of dead space, of which the UK is making a lot of the quadruples for the, for the dead space in there. And the reason for that was to basically, this is this design contingency. And it was a hard fought battle to keep this 127 meters in there because the civil construction people wanted to take that away. Um, but this reason here, we took a lot of risk there. Um, if you want to know what uh, the configuration is, um, you can go in here. There's a thing called Linac Lego. It basically can tell you about that. I see, I'm the one who wrote this, and I see a lot of UK hits here all the time, so I know there's a lot of UK people looking at this. Accelerator collaboration. This is the thing that has to do is that in order for this to work, you have to be in kind. We have this enormous collaboration. You might be proud of this, but you also should be scared of this, right? There's a lot of people that you need to get in line to make this happen. So it's, it's, it's amazing to, try to get this collaboration together, but it gets scary. In-kind contributions, okay, the cost of the next generation accelerator, as I've talked about this, it's so large that no single institution can afford this project. Okay, to fund ESS, we had to come up with this ambitious thing called in-kind contributions. 60% of this is doing there. And you can see this here, and I put a picture of a swing set here, because this is unnatural for what people normally to do. So if I want to build a swing set for my kids, I usually go off and I pay for the whole thing myself. If I couldn't afford it, I might go to my neighbor and say, hey, why don't you bring the swing, why don't you bring the slide? And normally he would say, go to hell, I'll, go do, I'll just get my own swing set together. But if you want to make the biggest swing set ever, then you, you pool together. But how do you convince that guy to buy the right swing, the right slide, and so on. It's, it's a very unnatural way of working, and we see this work as a struggle all the time. People at different institutes, they want to do things one way, different drawing programs, different ways of working, different way of doing reviews, different way of doing interfaces, um, and it's a constant struggle to try to get the in-kind contributors to want to work that way. The biggest thing you worry about is interfaces, okay? Um, so uh, what, is, what you have to do is you have to, um, uh, sorry, I jumped ahead of myself. One of the, the biggest things, the things you have to do then is you have to make compromises. You have to basically say, okay, uh, I want somebody to come over and, they want, and I want them to work something else, but I don't want them to sit there and just give, bring the bolts over. He wants to do something fun, okay? He wants to do something interesting. So you have to give them something interesting to do. Interesting things to do usually incre increase the risk of the project. So you have to be able to balance out these technical and cost risks against trying to keep your buddies interested in working with you. Okay, so that's a real hassle for us. That's a real hassle, I think, for us. Um, In-kind risks, as you can see, interfaces, I'm really worried about this. There's a, you know, if somebody brings a five-pin Burnley connector and there's got a three-pin socket, and we're sitting there going, how do we do this? That's a simple one, software interfaces. Uh, mechanical interfaces um, and electrical interfaces are gonna be very hard to do. The other thing, too, is there's a doubling handling of conventional procurement. I know I think some people are doing waveguides here. I'm not sure if that's still happening, but waveguides you go off and buy. Okay, so, so if there's two people handling the money, that costs twice as much. Okay, so normally you don't want to do in-kind contributions if somebody's just going to go off and buy that. And then there's the double management, the, the double management structures. You've got two management structures, and management is always taking a piece of the money off the top. Okay, so our front end section, okay, uh, the RFQ is done by Seclay. It's 3.6 MeV meters long. It's 4.5 meters long. It's really long. And the reason why it's long, so long, is our injection energy is 70 kV. The reason why our injection energy is 70 kV is because our levit is two meters long. Most levits are only about half a meter long, but people wanted to put lots of instrumentation in. They wanted to try new things with space charge compensation, so now we have a long levit. Long levit means you raise your injection energy. When you raise your injection energy, you make your RFQ longer because the beam's stiffer. Okay, so it seems kind of opposite, but that's one of the things that happened to. The DTL is basically straightforward DTL. It's like the, it's like the Linac 4 DTL, and it's being done by um, uh, Lignaro. Okay, the super, superconducting RF, 97% of the Linac is, is going to be superconducting RF. We have spokes in this section, and we have ellipticals in this section. Uh, the spoke cavities, uh, we're going to transition at 88 MeV. Some people would have loved to push that down even further. I think it would have been nicer to go a little bit higher. Um, the thing at 88 MeV and 352 megahertz, we decided to do, some people were doing single spoke resonators. We wanted to do double spoke resonators, again, because it was more interesting to do double spoke resonators. With double spoke resonators, then each cavity operates at 320 kilowatts, at 352 megahertz. 
So an RF power guy will sit there and say, ooh, what source does that? It's too low for a klystron as far as power because I have to pay for the klystron. It's too high a frequency for a tetrode. It's too, it's too high a power for an IoT. So it's in no man's land. Solid state, it's going to be awfully big. So we're really struggling trying to figure out what is going to be the power amplifier for the spoke section. And I'm not sure it's quite figured out yet. The ellipticals, uh, I'm just not going to go through this pretty quickly, but basically the, we, have, um, we have five cell high betas and we have six cell medium betas. The reason why we chose six cell medium betas because then we could have a universal cryo module. We're in such a high, we're going, we're going so fast that we don't have time to redesign the cryo module for each type of elliptical cell. So we want to have a universal cryo module. So we made a six cell cryo module for the medium betas because it was the same length as a five cell guy. But the trouble with that though is then you have velocity acceptance. The longer you make a, a cavity, superconducting accelerators, oh, let me get into that, I'll show you that in a second before I do that. Um, but one of the other things, too, is that we have a serious issue with Lorentz detuning. We're a pulse superconducting machine, but we're different from SNS. SNS's uh, pulse length is only a millisecond. So what SNS did is they basically turned off all their piezos. So what happens when you put a lot of energy into a superconducting cavity, the radiation pressure expands the cavity and the frequency drops down. So there's a mechanical time constant that goes to this thing. The mechanical time constant is on the order of one millisecond. SNS pulse length is on the order of one millisecond. So you can kind of pre-tune yourself out of trouble. You squeeze the cavity and you pre-tune it. But here we're at three milliseconds. So basically we can do some pre-tuning, but then the mechanical time constant is long enough that we'll drift out of that. Thank God we have a lot of beam current, but we paid with that with a lot of klystrons. But still, um, you need to be able to have these tuners to basically squeeze the cavity back into resonance. Otherwise, you'd have to pay for that in RF power. You'd have to have more klystron overhead to do that. So this point here, these piezos have to work. There's nobody running around a LINAC where a piezo is pulsing 14 times a second going that's trying to hit, push back on it. This is going to be a new thing that's going to happen. It would have been nice to hear Rebecca talk about this as far as reliability because this might be an issue with reliability. Um, the next thing is that with superconducting sources is everybody has their own personality. So each, each cavity has its own um, uh, Lorentz tuning coefficient. You try to keep them the same, but you can see from SNS, they're not quite the same. So it's common wisdom, you don't gang up superconducting cavities together. ILC is proposing to try to do this. Nobody's really done it. Usually you have one cavity, one power source. Okay, okay so, and then the next thing is because if you have one cavity, one power source, what you don't want to do is redesign a new superconducting cavity for every velocity that you do as you do in a normal conducting linac. In a normal conducting linac, you change the, the, the transit, you change the cavity structure to match your transit time as you go through. The superconducting cavity, you can't do that. So you design families. And then the families have a velocity acceptance. And because the velocity acceptance, we span over a large range, the power profile is not flat. And I'll show you that. So basically, you can see here now, this is the power profile of the individual ca uh, cavity strings. Here's the high beta, here's the medium beta. And the reason why they do this curve here is because you can push in the peak surface uh, field into the cavity, but the beam won't accept it. So even though you have a lot of volts in the cavity, the beam says, you're at the long velocity, I won't accept it, so I can only put a certain amount of power into there. And that's why you have these cavities here running so low. They're running low power, but they're running high peak surface fields at this point here. And so one now will have to worry about the transit time. If a number of these guys fail, then you won't get the velocity through and you won't get the beam to get through the other side as you go through that. Okay, so that's another issue. And so then you're left with this LINAC with these 100 klystrons here, and you can look at the SNS klystron. It looks very complicated. Okay, um, so this is a picture of the 704 megahertz layout. You basically have, uh, you have five cells in a cavity. You have four cavities in a cryo module. You have uh, four, uh, two cryo modules in a cell, and you have eight klystrons in a cell, and it just balloons up. Okay, so there's another picture here that looks in there. Things like that. Okay, installation. Okay, this is uh, another thing. It is imperative for the uh, for to produce spallation neutron sources by the end of 2019. We're told this every day. We must have beam by 2019. Otherwise, the funding will be at jeopardy. What that means, I don't have no idea, but we're told this every day. 
Okay, um, so therefore, by midnight, June 30th, 2019, we shall have been. Okay, um, you can tell I've been in the trenches for a while. You get a little bit shell-shocked after a bit. Okay, um, the medium beta prototype has to be completed by September 2016. This is an old slide I just pulled out. Oh, it's not, it has not been completed. We have to have the medium beta cryo modules have to begin serial production by 2017. We have to install 71 RF systems by 2019, which implies one RF system every three days. We have to install 800 electronic racks by 2019, which means 3.5 racks per day. Uh, we have initial cool down by May 21st, 2019. We commissioned the full gradient, all 64 cavities in a month, and then we get the beam by 2019. And it just looks like this, that we put this stuff together. We've done a lot of planning. Um, we have, this is what the tunnel looks like. We've got drawings. It looks quite complicated. Okay. So this is where I got involved. I used to be the chief engineer. I'm no longer the chief engineer. Um, now I basically run the integration test end. And the integration test end, what I did is I wanted, I didn't want to spend all my time working in an office building. I said, sooner or later, we've got to turn this greenfield site into something that's real. And the biggest things you have to worry about with the Greenfield site is you have to worry about the logistical infrastructure that people take for granted. And you have to bootstrap that in, uh, from, their, from their thing. So what do you need to worry about? You need to worry about total system performance. You need to worry about safety. I spent my whole summer writing a safety manual because we didn't have one. So an engineer, had, and the best people to do this are engineers because they know what, what can hurt them. Okay, uh, not, not the safety people, but the engineers that are doing it are the best people to write safety manuals. We have to worry about shipping and receiving. We're very good at that now, but we do it ourselves. We have to worry about utilities, controls, et cetera. So the goal of a test strand that we needed is unforeseen, unforeseen uh, logistical issues and the measurement of complex system performance. And the other thing to do is we get to recruit staff. So if you try to get somebody like you guys here to come work for us, you don't want to work in an office building. You want to build things, okay? So you want to really come to a place that does things. Okay. so. What we wanted to do is we wanted to do something that was something you could do, but not too simple. So we decided to build an RF transmitter section for the, for the, for the LINAC. And here it is. So it took us about uh, nine months to do it. We're up, we're running. Uh, we, we got the modular. We haven't got the Klystron finally up and running. We actually have two Klystrons here. What we did is we bought CERN a, a modulator, we gave it to them, and then we took it back. So don't ever take anything from us, we'll take it back. Okay, then we have, we got a Klystron. This is an old LEP Klystron, and there's a Toshiba Klystron that's sitting here right now. And this is our test modulator that we're building here. Okay, so these things are up and running. So ESS has real hardware to work with. Um, we're building a new stacked uh, resident, uh, stacked um, multi-level modulator. This is done by Carlos Martins. This is be state of the event modulators. Most people use bouncers these days. What we decided to do, that wouldn't work for the three millisecond pulse. We basically have, we're using, um, we're doing active front ends and we're basically going from AC to DC and we're doing pulse width modulation at the DC and then we're transforming up and instead of using a bouncer modulator, we're using multiple um, um, high frequency modulators at uh, 25 kilohertz and then rectifying them. I'm going through this very quickly, but it's a state-of-the-art modulator. One of the things that's gonna be pretty fun about this um, is that it has an AC to DC conversion front, so it has an active front end. One of the things that Sweden is, it's a greenfield site. And one of the ideas that we came up with, and we're gonna try to do this, is you could hook solar panels right into the, dis right into the front end here. Because the sun's not shining, like today, then you take the power from the grid. If the sun is shining, then we have enough grid, we could put enough solar panels with only a th about a third of the site to power the entire accelerator for the third of the site would go in there, even in Sweden. So Sweden, turns out, has 60% the solar energy potential that Morocco does, okay? And I've been, to Mor I've been to Casablanca, and I've been to Sweden. I'm amazed that those numbers come out, but you go through the databases, that it, it, it is really the case. Okay, so we're not doing this, but this is some of the crazy ideas that we think of at the test stand on this thing, and I think alternative energy and accelerators is a pretty cool thing, so we're thinking about doing that. Okay, good. All right, um, I'm almost done. So, okay. So here's Dave's scary list. Okay, um, no particular order and not my opinion. So uh, I, only my opinion, not anybody else's at ESS opinion. Everything else is going fine. We're on schedule. Everything's going great. Okay. 
and I'll just run through these lists. And what I don't want to do is I don't want to just bore you with details. This is something you guys can talk about later on or come up and ask me what you really think about this. Interfaces, interfaces, interfaces. The mechanical ones we'll get. We'll get the beam pipes together. The software ones, they're going to be tough. Uh, electrical ones, they'll be tough too. Hot water cooling of klystrons. One of the things that's the reason why um, ESS is in Sweden is that they said they would be a green accelerator. And uh, Sweden recycles, uses heat, uh, central district heating. Um, I'm not sure they do that in the UK, but basically they have big plants and they distribute the heat so that nobody may have their own furnace. You, you, you get their heat. To me, coming from the United States, this is like a communist plot. But now I find out that, that, that this, is, well, this is a great thing because when somebody decides to go from burning garbage or from burning natural gas to burning garbage to burning wood to putting solar panels in, I don't have to change my furnace downstairs. I get to use whatever the city provides to me. So we wanted to take our klystron collector heat and we wanted to actually put that in in terms of put in the waste heat. That means we had to run our klystron collectors up at 60 degrees. Anybody who works with klystrons know they run around six bar. Okay, so now you have 60 degree water at six bar. Everybody that works with klystrons know that the hoses pop every once in a while. And you don't want to get hit with 60 degree water at six bar. But anyway, so that, that scares me a bit. And I keep telling people we need to worry about that. I think there's other ways to be green, but okay. Smoke power amplifiers. Relief pressure and elliptical cryo modules. Everybody wants worries that this is a pressure vessel. People have not been able to struggle, get the answer right with superconducting RF. It's such a new field. Is it a pressure vessel? Is it not a pressure vessel? What you do is you put your relief pressure very low. But if your relief pressure is very low, somebody's sitting in the tunnel. Okay, and that means that valve can pop off when somebody's in the tunnel. And you gotta be careful because you don't wanna be squirted with a bunch of cryogens. Okay, we didn't put any drainage in the tunnel. This is some Swedish thing, but everybody here knows that water spills out of an accelerator. Okay, the rebar in the tunnel is at three centimeter depth. This is just the simple things that people worry about. We have to drill 2,000 holes down to six centimeters, so that's gonna be a lot of fun. We bend a five megawatt beam up, that's because we got architects involved, okay? They wanted the klystron roof not to be so high, so they put the accelerator lower than the target. The target's gotta be at grade, and so we take a five megawatt beam bend up. Um, that's unusual. Um, the LINAC is in line with the target. That's usually not the case, because you have to have a straight ahead tuning dump. Now that you're bending the beam up and you have a straight ahead tuning dump, you gotta squeeze your little tuning dump underneath the LINAC. That limits how much steel you can put underneath it, which limits how much power you're there. So you're taking a five megawatt accelerator and you're putting a little tiny tuning dump underneath it. Okay. Um, the medium beta, uh, the, 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 this acceptance I talked about, our BPMs, we like to collaborate. So we collaborate with DAISY, which is an electron machine, and they like button BPMs. But if you work with protons, you need to have long guys. Okay, so we got, we working with the collaborators. They wanted something like this long. Protons, you should have something like that long. Uh, cryo module, we're under a lot of schedule. Talked about the RFQ length. Machine protection's a big deal, and people get caught up into things. Do you put everything in the machine protection? If you do, you get into trouble with that because local protection should be your number one choice. Protect my own stuff, okay? I, if my power, if, if my load's going bad, it's my job to turn it off, not, not the mothership to do that. Um, but some people get themselves into that, so we have to be very careful. Technical staffing, love living in Sweden. Sweden, I would never want to go back to Chicago. It's a great place to live. But trying to talk somebody to come to Sweden is a bit difficult because the language has a bit of a barrier, just like coming here for me. It would be a big barrier for me to come here. Um, and then the salary levels, but it's a great place to live. Greenfield site, I talked about this. And then this in-kind tra technology transfer, plus there's a lot of other things. So that's about where I'm at. There's no great conclusions. I just thought I'd put together kind of how it's gone to progress. I don't want to scare anybody. We will make it work. Everybody makes the accelerators work. It just means that instead of hearing how wonderful things are, we have some challenges ahead of us. Thank you. So, thanks very much, Dave. That was very interesting. Any questions today? We've got time for a few, few questions. Steve. Oh, hello. Uh, okay, so at one point you were talking about the sort of uh, relative efficiencies between a superconducting cavity and a normal conducting cavity, which is, if I've understood is about the amount of power you have to put into your cryogenic systems versus the amount of power that you'd have to put into your RF systems, right. and that then relates to the duty factor. So uh, is there a sort of rough rule of thumb where uh, a duty factor level where uh, the sort of, there's a break-even point where you then go to superconducting 
cavities? It, it depends on what you value. Again, it, it, there's, there's also people talk about civil construction costs, and that's a big deal for somebody like the ILC that drives that. For operational costs, the break-even point that we have for the cryogenic costs compared to the cryogenic plant is somewhere around 10, 15 years out, and that's way past, that's a little too long. My own personal view, and people talk about this, I think you should have at least a 10% duty factor, okay? And I think you should at least have a dynamic to static load ratio, three to, uh, th dynamic to static, three to one. Th those should be so the gut checks. But SNS is not like that. ESS is not like that. PIP2 is not going to be like that. However, LCLS2 is totally like that. I mean, they, they're almost all dynamic, low static. And then the other thing, too, is the, um, uh, you know, the thing is that you design your cryo module that when you're for the dynamic loads, the dynamic heat loads, and when you're in the tunnel, that dynamic heat load goes away, so your accelerator is actually very much safer on that thing. So, so there's, it really needs to be looked at. I don't want, I'm, I, I like superconducting RF. I think it's a lot, but people need to really start, start asking themselves about this. For a proton Linux, it's hard to justify. And the other thing to, to take a look at is those power curves. So we talked about the cryogenic cost. You gotta talk about what you're doing into the collectors of your klystrons. So those klystrons are sitting there, you know, you're going down like this, the beam won't accept the power, and your klystron um, uh, is sitting up there biased for the, for, the full, for the full enchilada, right? It's up there sitting there, and you're, and you're not using it. So you might as well make the cavity out of mud at that point, right? You know, it doesn't make a difference. You re so that's why copper structures are great. All klystrons, they're running full out right when they're supposed to be doing that, okay? With the superconducting cavity, it's not. So we did propose, I proposed a few years ago, of using um, IOTs. But the problem is you need to have um, megawatt class IOTs. So we came up with multi-beam IOTs. We just got it first tested at um, L3. It is working. And the nice thing about a gridded tube is that you can run in class C, and then you can make the efficiency there. So I think if superconducting RF is going to make its uh, way into the proton world, um, it needs to really start addressing how efficient these RF power sources are. That, to me, is the biggest issue. Uh, do you have a sweet stake on when your startup date will actually be and when you'll get to 2019, one megawatt? June, June 1st, 2019. <laughs> you bet a month's salary on that? No, June 1st, 2019. <laughs> you guys can guess. I, it's tough. I don't know how to do it. You know, we'll see. It's tough. But it, it's politics, right? You know, it's, so we have to see what, what they do. Okay, any other questions? No, okay, so let's thank Dave again for a very interesting. Thank you.